Hello everybody, welcome to the Football Daily Weekly. Good to have you looking at us. Lawrence is here. How you doing? The Football Daily Weekly regular. Unfortunately for some. Ah, oh, but fortunately for most, I'd say. And mm -hmm. Lindsay Hooper. Hello. Hey, freelance broadcaster and uh, yep, one of... Yeah, that out there. Yes, yeah. indeed, yeah, if anyone is looking for... Uh, <laughs> My card. You know, a gun to hire. <laughs> and uh, obviously of the Offside Podcast. Yes. The Offside Rule Podcast. Offside Rule Podcast, yeah. you know. We get it. We get All it right. in brackets. Yeah, because some of us listen. Superb yeah. stuff. Let's talk about the five things we learned from the weekend's footballing action. First up, Liverpool are managerless. For yeah. now, at the rudderless, time of recording. Rudderless, some people say. Rudderless. Indeed. Um, but they're looking at Jurgen Klopp. That's what we think, Lindsay. That's what we think. Just looking. That's what the indications are. I mean, we're hearing, aren't we, that by Friday he'll have signed a three-year contract. And all the indications are he's the sort of manager that the Liverpool owners would go for. He's mm -hmm. young. They want someone for about a 10 year period, mm -hmm. um, although a three year contract, you're presuming that would be an extended. Rolling, right? Bringing yeah. through younger players. Mm -hmm. But the players that he's got there already at the club, is this a good fit? I think we also have to throw another name into the mix Carlo Ancelotti. Yes. What makes you say that name? I mean, what makes everyone say that name? Because it's lots already been in. Yeah, yeah, good yeah point. lots of people have said the name. However, the timing off the back of Mourinho having another defeat at Chelsea, yeah. mm -hmm. and we know how much Roman Abramovich likes to bring in previous managers. Do you think Liverpool thought, uh oh, yeah. he might he might actually try and put that phone call in, we'll do it first? Mm. Or do you think do you think Liverpool just worried that Chelsea would lose the manager and they'd either go for Klopp or Ancelotti, because the worry would be that you know, che essentially, Chelsea have always lusted after exciting football. Yeah, and it is potentially that you know they they have a squad that could play very exciting football. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of very talented players in there. Um, so Liverpool just they struck before Chelsea. So it's not just Ancelotti; it's Klopp as well. Well, because Chelsea might have gone for Klopp if exactly. if, if uh, they were looking to sack Marino, but they did come out and say. That they're going to support him, but you know the difference. So, but then Liverpool could wait on a few weeks, and then Mourinho might be available. <laughs> but then Mourinho said actually in the press not long ago, "I will never manage Liverpool," and and I can't say why. And I always thought that was interesting. because he wanted the Man United job. Possibly, yeah, that's I, a good point. He what, denies that to the hilt, but what, we all know. What I would say about Klopp is, and what you were asking about the squad, I find quite interesting mm. because you can almost directly transpose some of the players from his Dortmund team directly into the Liverpool team. So you could go, does he have a big man up front that you can treat as a bit of a target yeah, man? Yeah. Yes. Does he have some tricky guys just behind him who are very technically gifted? Yes. Does he have sort of a defensive midfielder that can that also transition quite nice? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Does he have a defence that needs some work, but he, he can quite clearly be aggressive enough that it almost becomes, offence becomes defence. Well, there's certainly something to work with there. Yeah, so he's got a... And a partisan home crowd. And the second youngest squad in the league. If you like. Chelsea are plumbing to new depths. They were beaten 3-1 by Southampton at home at Stamford Bridge. I mean, it could have been four. Could have been yeah. five if his penalties were given, although Mourinho seemed to think that they deserved the penalty and then forgot about Southampton's perhaps more legitimate claims. Yeah, points. exactly. Um, I mean, what did you make of all this with, with Mourinho? Every week now we say, oh, he's going to turn around and turn around. You see the Arsenal result and their traditional 2 0 win against mm. Arsenal. And then suddenly this happens and it was so abject from Chelsea, it really was. You'd, say, you'd just say it's a poor tactical decision. You can't bring a player on, well, you could bring a player on for half an hour, Mourinho did, but it's sort of a weird thing to do, isn't it? You'd have said, surely you should have read the game better than that. But he wanted to take off a defensive midfielder. But he brought him on. He did bring him on, but he, he brought him on when the score wasn't 3-1. Yes, but what I'm what I'm saying is that surely Mourinho, like the tactics that Mourinho, he never obviously he never thought it would go to three one, mm -hmm. but you'd still say then that's poor game management in the first place. So bringing Matic on changed things tactically and made it three one. Well, whatever you think of that decision, me personally, I I would actually let him off there and say it was tactical. But as you say, Lindsay, the the, the talk is he's lost the dressing room and the players who. Um, fought so readily for him. You know, he likes to cultivate a kind of a, uh, a, a squadron-like mentality, doesn't he? He wants battlers, he wants warriors fighting for mm. him. But if you then don't believe in him, or he's perhaps annoyed you, then the fight in which you take up is no longer there. But what, what do you do if your boss has got your back up against a wall? You get defensive, don't you? Exactly, so yeah. rather than That's playing for the team, <laughs> rather than playing for the team, they're playing individually because they don't want to be the next one to have his wrath. So I feel like they're not playing collectively anymore, but I know a lot has been directed at the defence. I know that Ivanovic has come under a lot of criticism, but for me, the most disappointing player this season is Cesc Fabregas. He is nowhere near the player that he was last season, the season before. Yeah. I've heard on the grapevine he actually has an injury that is ongoing. He's playing through. 
that he's playing through and I think it's a hamstring problem. Now whether that's true or not, that was just something I've heard yeah. on the rounds. But he isn't a happy player, you can tell that. And actually, he's sticking with him, he's persevering with Sesk. And for me, he should have been substituted way back a few games ago and rested. If he's got a niggle, let him sort that out because at the moment he's not been effective at all. Yeah, well Mourinho likes loyalty. I'm sure all managers do, but particularly Mourinho. And perhaps that's why he's, he's persevering with Fabregas and Ivanovic as well. That these guys are maybe the ones in the dressing room that are, that are listening to Bruin and sticking with him. I mean, it's all speculation, of course. But, but, but they're sort of they're sort of in the boat where they have to because they're not playing particularly well. So it's almost right. like, well, of course I'm going to have to stick with you because if I go the opposite way, then I'm out in the cold. Mm -hmm. And we saw what happened with Maluda and a number of other players who were literally just put in the reserves and told go rot there. Mm -hmm. So it, it, essentially, it's Mourinho's misdirection and things that made me miss serving him right now because our analysis is so confused like you could literally take any narrative you want about Chelsea and make it work yeah. he's got the dressing room he doesn't have yeah. the dressing room because one week he does next week he doesn't uh -huh. so he's made a rod for his own back and if we're going to beat other managers with the same thing do it with don't do it in Mourinho but I think the weird thing he said at the weekend was give us give us a break and you're like <laughs> no no like you're a multi-millionaire managing a multi-millionaire group of people mm. having spent a, a ton of money mm. down the years you should be held accountable to the, with the club because the, like I, there was that fan rant to the weekend, right? And I really felt for that guy because he was clearly so confused and angry. But think, I mean, he knew how to, how to express it, but not maybe not in the most eloquent way. He was angry at people leaving at seventy-five minutes. I would be angry at people leaving at seventy-five. He was like, "There's no atmosphere." And I was like, "Welcome to the bridge." But at the same time, you sort of say, "Well, you know what? Yeah, they shouldn't be leaving at seventy-five minutes." In Serie A, Napoli are breaking into a gallop, and things get very interesting in a league that's been dominated by. Interesting. Well, if you like, um, it's a league that's been dominated by Juventus in the last uh, few years. Certainly, Juve having a disastrous start. The Inter looked pretty good. Uh, until Fiorentina came to town and, and beat them. Roma, Roma as well. I mean, Lazio. Are the teams? Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Napoli. <Et> al. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Napoli are, are looking good at the moment. Serie A. But no, any yeah. any team sort of caught your eye, Lindsay, so far? Because there's been a few. And well, yeah, Napoli have been, have been brilliant. Fiorentina, who are top of the league at the moment, mm. they're going five games unbeaten. Yeah. You've got quite a few teams who've who've got an unbeaten run. Yeah. It's really unpredictable. What I'm loving about Serie A at the moment, and we do quite a lot of work on the offside rule with Mina Rizuki, who's a yeah. big expert in this area, and she's yeah. just saying it is wide open. Yeah. And everyone she must be who, upset about Juve though, right? Oh, she's, she's a big Juve Yeah, she's yes. a big Juve fan. Well, she's she's deeply small. upset about that. But what what is really interesting from an from maybe a neutral's point of view, which I consider myself to be, you know, I dip in and out of the foreign foreign leagues. But usually you see two, three teams that are always at the top. And you'd expect Juve just to, to run clear towards the end. Yeah. But it looks wide open and it's exciting to be able to see all these different teams teams who've got I think different parts to their armour. I think everyone brings something different. One of the things that I'm really disappointed in myself is at the very start of the season I tipped Edin Dzeko for massive things. It's like, you know, he's the striker that Man City have let go that actually is, it, I, I always thought clinical striker, deadly in front of goal, but um, apart from the first game for Roma, he's really gone He is injured now though, isn't he? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. you feel a bit sorry for him yeah. because actually he's a striker that has, I think he found the right club mm. in Roma. Um, Unlike Ashley Cole. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, Ashley didn't want to go on a holiday at the end of his career, so that served him well. And then I, I, what I would say is also, in terms of what Lazio are doing, they've had these incredibly talented players and have not really been able to line them up in the way that they wanted to for a while. Last season was a bit of a weird one with Benitez because it was sort of like, I'm going to Real Madrid next season, so let's just coast this one. <laughs> um, and, and then now we're looking at also maybe AC Milan just looking awful. And it was, I mean, it's quite disappointing to see like Sabaka going there and a couple of other people. Montalivo is almost wasted there. Mm. And there's a couple of other young, Suso from Liverpool went there. He was an incredibly talented young individual who mm. maybe just couldn't make it into the squad because of the likes of Coutinho. So th there's some, you know, there's a lot of talented people there, but then there's also, there's still some wastage. What you do think is it's almost completely changing its uh, image as a league. Because a few years ago, it was seen as very dirty, mm -hmm. drugged up, slightly washed out, mm -hmm. sort of or corrupt, boring, corrupt league, and they're, they're really trying to change that. They are. And I think you know, getting rid of certain owners um, <laughs> has really helped that. But some of them are still there. Some of them are still there. Yeah. Who would you expect to rise like a phoenix from the flames? And, and start to properly lead the series. Juve, Juve are coming good now, aren't they? And I think they okay. will catch up. But 
I don't know, it's hard because I think Napoli have looked so impressive, I can't see them slipping too far off the pace. But Juve are going to be up there. Okay. You would they expect so, but then we, we keep saying this about Chelsea. Well, yeah. Lawrence? Uh, did Balotelli inspire Milan? No. Okay. Um, there's something about... Uh, I like Bal I love Balotelli. I think he's a great, great character. Cappuccino. That's what I was thinking is... Great character, yeah. Great. That's yeah. what I'm looking for when I'm a manager. Top, great top, character, top, great player, top. great, yeah. great character. Yeah, yeah. both. Yeah. Unfortunately, he's not See? there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, old Jürgen. Uh, I, like, I love Fiorentina watching them, but you do get feeling... There's that beautiful purple kit. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. No one else has a purple kit like that. Fortunately, otherwise they'd have to play an away kit. That's right. But, um, you know, th th I'd say Fiorentina, or I actually, I, I resent Lazio because of the right tendencies. But, you know, you've got to say that Lazio are looking pretty good this season. Mm -hmm. Well, they're all looking pretty good. I'm going to go for, uh, I don't know. Sampdoria. Bologna. Serie B. We've not mentioned them, even though they lost. Uh, wonderful stuff. Let's know source. who you think is going to win Serie A this season. The Emirates has a much different prospect in the league after uh, mm -hmm. Arsenal's disastrous uh, Champions League result against Olympiacos. And then hammered Manchester United 3-0. Could have been four, Lindsay, by half time. I mean, we've not seen this from Arsenal against uh, one of the big sides, have we, for a little while? No, and in the lead up to that game, I was in a press conference with quite a lot of journos. Mm. I wish I could credit the right one, I can't remember who said it, but someone said, Oh, you what, mark my words, Arsenal are due a big win over one of the big four sides. Yeah. Um, and, and they've they been went, saying that for years, and <laughs> <though>. we're <laughs> about to happen. Yeah. Every yeah, press yeah, conference, yeah. he just goes, you know, like, We're at the Leicester press conference, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, I thought that they were very, very good at the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, Alexis Sanchez, when he's on fire, oh he'll, he'll just create fear into any defence, won't he? Learn the whole defence down. Yeah, and one of my favourite players in the Premier League, along with David Silva, but we won't digress. Um, <laughs> very different players. Very different yeah, yeah. players. Um, I thought they were great. Yeah, it could, they could have been four, five, six even up mm. at, at one point. But what I will say is your opening statement about the Emirates. The Emirates hadn't been a happy hunting ground for the start of the season. In fact, they had failed to score there in their opening home two games. They then conceded against Olympiacos three goals. I wouldn't say it's a fortress by any stretch of the imagination, but I think this result perhaps sets them and might, might be a turning point when you look back at Christmas. Mm. If they're up there at first or second, they'll say, oh, that was the result that did it. Do you think that's the, the difference, Lawrence, is when we think of grounds that we've called fortresses before, last season, Stamford Bridge, and previous seasons as well under Mourinho, or Trafford, of course, under Trafford Ferguson. It's the expectation, isn't it, that teams go to those grounds and think, we'll just be happy to nick a point here mm -hmm. or, or not disgrace ourselves. Whereas at the Emirates, teams turn up and think, if we just defend well against Arsenal, actually we could nick a goal up the other end and we could come yeah. on three points. And it's important for Arsenal to make the Emirates into that ground that teams don't want to go. And do you think they're beginning to do that or is it a bit hasty? And it's one result, isn't it? Mm. Um, and every season they do have this incredible result and everyone goes, well, Arsenal have reached their zenith. <laughs> what is going And then they, and then, you know, and I'd be, the thing is, I'd be very happy if Arsenal went in that run, but the problem is there's been inconsistency down the years that makes it so difficult to analyse whether this is going to result in a Wenger run or whether he's just, you know, people are going to end up capitulating. And there are so many variables in that, injured players, the mentality of the squad, mm. the way that they approach these big games, whether part of it is, well, we've proven ourselves now, do we need to really, really do it again? Mm -hmm. They've got Monk after that Chelsea. Maybe it's a good thing that they beat Lou Van Gaal, but at the same time, I think a lot of people are caveating that by saying Manchester United didn't really set out in the best way. Ashley Young playing fullback. Yeah, and then the Fellaini substitution didn't really work out very well for them. You'd also say United, very poor at putting away their chances on the day. Rooney just putting things into Rose. Martial Hoot made it through. Yeah, and the, maybe you know the worst time for this Rooney dog to come out because he's sort of king of the goals or something, and it's sort of like, well, that was an awkward weekend. Um, <laughs> Bayern Munich are quite clearly the team to beat in Europe, which doesn't bode well for Arsenal. They are in magnificent form. They beat Borussia Dortmund 5-1. I mean, the, Dortmund are the second best team at the moment in Germany, mm. the league form would suggest that. And Bayern have just brushed them aside, Lawrence. Mm. Yeah, but then... Uh, 5-1. So what? what like, so what? Well, Bayern are really good. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a bit of a monopoly on the league anyway. See, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay. I would I would actually argue that that, that scoreline was a little unfair on yeah. Borussia Dortmund. They gave away a couple of sloppy goals. They gave really away nice. a couple of sloppy goals, but I think that was more out of frustration because we were just talking about Italy in our, in our last topic. And I can see a lot of Italian influence, in particular sort of Perlo in this Bayern Munich side. The way that Perlo spreads those passes, 
this passing ability within the Bayern squad now has even gone as far back as the centre backs. I mean, Jerome Boateng got two assists mm -hmm. in that game. His passing was sublime. So there's there's Borussia Dortmund playing a game where they're pressing really high, they're pressing the midfield. That, I mean, Xabi Alonso did not get in the game. Yeah. They were doing their job. That was obviously their tactic. But what you can't do is press the centre back. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I really felt for them. I thought they went there with a really good game plan, but. I think just quality throughout the squad, Bayern are just head and shoulders. Well, that's, that's you great. do one thing I would say about Xabi Alonso is he's one of the best players without the ball. Yeah, and he really takes pressure off people. So the, I mean, Liverpool didn't essentially have two world class centre backs. They had two very, two very good centre backs. But you say the same at Real Madrid is that they. At times they have very shaky centre backs, and having Xavi Alonso sit in front of them is a real shield because whether you've got the ball or not, he either shepherds play or creates space for a centre back to step into or a centre back to pass into or gives them, gives them the easy out. Mm. And it makes your system so much more fluid and allows so much other players the room yeah. to manoeuvre. Yeah. I'm not saying he's central because I do think they look great without him as well, but I certainly think with him in the side, they look a lot more controlling of matches. Yeah, I mean, but Guardiola is so. F uh, tactically flexible, isn't he? Uh, and, and his teams are as well, to their enormous credit. And we've seen Dortmund, they've often played a pressing style under Klopp, they did. I, I remember previous years, you know, that Guardiola knew this was going to happen. I think he played, was it Javi Martinez further up the, the field? Yes. And would just play long balls, almost bypass that, and think, oh, you're going to run it, that's, that's fine, we'll just knock it over the top. Yeah. Which is, some people say that could be quite a primitive tactic, but actually, when Guardiola's doing it, he just brings the best. And, at the moment, they've got Lewandowski, who is a fantastic target man, who's scoring goals like they're going out of fashion. Best number nine in the world right now. In, the most informed number nine in the world. Certainly, right now, you, could, you, could, you could argue that. So they have so many options, Lindsay, don't they? They do, and it's not an accident. No. When Jerome Boateng is... is <laughs> if it was. <laughs> what an accident. Shit! Oh, God! <laughs> But when, when he's spraying those balls, yeah. like you say, it's sort of NFL-esque. Yeah. And it's you, not a hit and hope. It's not a hit and hope. It's not. And they're working on that on the training pitch, you can tell. And if I was any team in the Champions League at the moment, I'd be really fearful of Bayern Munich because they're showing all the signs of being the team to beat. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be about Spain this time. Not like it was last last year. I think it's about Bayern. And I think I think apart from the, the glitch at the start of the season with the cup, yeah. um, which which was disappointing because he's not got a very good record in the in the German Cup, has he? Uh, Pep Guardiola with Bayern at the moment. But apart from that, they. They look in a completely different class to anyone else. But I think the nearest competitors, Dortmund, on a different day, the tactics perhaps would have paid off a little bit more. I think 5-1 was flattering to Bayern, but I, I think they were easily the winners. Yeah, obviously. and when there were a few goals down, obviously it makes a difficult chase in the game. But Lawrence, Especially I mean, if you're counter-attacking yeah, side. But just, just quickly on Bayern, I mean, it, it's so many different styles. You know, Guardiola at Barcelona. That phenomenal Impressive. team. The, the, the slight yeah. criticism, if you could ever aim it at him, was that they didn't have a plan B. Mm -hmm. Whereas at Bayern, he seems to have plan A, B, C, and D. The team also looked a lot fitter now that he's there as well. Mm -hmm. Weirdly, um, so there's you know there, there's a lot there's a lot to be said for not only what he gets them to do on the pitch, but what he gets them to do off the pitch as well. And I think people really buy into the project. Um, it'll be interesting to see what he set up there for the next guy to take over with and whether there is already a plan in place because it would seem, according to journalists in Spain and in Germany, that are close to Pep, that he wants to go uh, after this contract ends. So how Bayern transition away from that will be interesting. Thank you very much for watching everybody. That is the end of the Football Daily Weekly for another week. Get your comments in below. Thank you very much to Lawrence Pleasure nice. and Lindsay Hooper as Good well. Good to have you on, Thank you for nice. having me on. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Do check out the Offside Rule podcast and you can see Lindsay all over the your screens. Um, maybe people, screens? well I am on screen as well, but yeah. listen to the podcast is what I would say. If you try and watch it, it could be hard work. Where are okay. you going this weekend with the football? <laughs> um, I am off because it's international weekend. Oh, you not do, do you not do the international I don't tend don't to do as much with England. Mm. But sometimes um, we hear your voice on the BBC. And yes, um, and I was, yeah, I was at Wickham Northampton yeah. last weekend, and then the weekend before I was at Norwich, Bournemouth. There you go. Lindsay so Hooper, there Five Live, brilliant. That's the, my favourite bit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Three one, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, oh, that's my favourite bit. Of the that's whole because they're saying keep it short, so three one is usually just all I say. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay Hooper, three one, thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> Enjoy the football. Mm.